it's not a secret that uh, AI technology has been advancing dramatically in the last decade. And yet, if you've played with tools like ChatGPT recently, you probably know that they still have some way to go. They're not particularly good at logical reasoning. They're not very good at introspecting on what they know or thinking logically about what they say. And their knowledge is frozen in time at the point where their data set was curated. And it's actually quite expensive to get them to learn new things. But they do have one superpower. As it happens, it's a superpower that's shared by many people in this building. It is the ability to write code. Now, you're probably thinking, wait, really? That's it? Programming? I mean, yeah, we all recognize that programming is a very valuable skill that basically makes modern civilization possible. But a superpower? Let's take a moment first to consider what is the miracle of modern programming. Our computing systems today are more complex and more powerful than they've ever been. Think about a simple desktop, maybe a high-end one. It has a CPU with maybe 40 billion transistors in it, and a GPU with twice as many. And getting them to work together, as you need, for example, in even a simple video game, requires this careful choreography of data moving from one chip to another through different kinds of memory at rates that are really hard for the human mind to fathom. And yet, harnessing this complexity has never been easier. I can write in 25 lines of Python code a program that harnesses all these power to, for example, recognize faces in an image. Right? This is the power of modern programming. This is what made it possible, for example, for a system like Instagram to be built in a matter of a few months and then to scale to 100,000 users in a matter of days. OK, so modern programming really is quite powerful. But what does this have to do with artificial intelligence? So if you go back to the earliest days of AI, right? Back in the day, you had uh, you know, pioneers, people like John McCarthy, who believed that the way we're going to achieve AI is that we could take all the knowledge in the world and encode it into logical rules, logical statements, that then the machine would be able to reason logically about their consequences, their implication, manipulate this, and be able to solve challenging problems. Turned out this approach to AI kind of fell out of favor. Turns out the world is pretty messy and complicated, and it's kind of hard to capture it all in simple logical rules. And so the field started moving more towards statistical approaches. Today, for example, we have deep neural networks, which are able to capture statistical patterns and huge amounts of data. Right? And this shift is the reason why we have these tools that are so good at sounding human and so bad at even basic logical reasoning. For example, uh, recently I asked uh, uh, GPT-4, uh, I asked it, hey, is it OK for somebody to be married to the daughter of their mother-in-law? No. Apparently, GPT-4 uh, says no. I'm still not quite sure how to explain to my wife that apparently we've been breaking a major social taboo uh, in the world, right? This is what you get um, with, uh, with this kind of systems. But it turns out that while most of the field of AI moved away from a lot of these ideas, there was one domain where they lived on. And you could argue that they've actually been quite successful. And this was programming. In fact, you could say that probably some of the uh, most important lasting legacy of a lot of that early stages of AI was actually the development of the Lisp programming language, which uh, went on to influence many of the languages we use today, including such staples as uh, JavaScript, for example. Not only that, but it turns out we really do have these giant repositories of knowledge, uh, nicely encoded in machine-usable form, ready to be deployed to solve problems. We have these massive repositories of code, things like 
the node package manager or the Python uh, program, uh, the Python index, uh, package index, which capture these enormous amounts of human knowledge ready to be deployed to solve problems. And so when you have this kind of power and all of a sudden when our AI systems are able to leverage it, all of a sudden they can do things that potentially they weren't able to do before. We call these neurosymbolic programming when you have these AI systems being able to leverage the power of modern programming in order to solve problems. Now, to give you just a few examples, uh, a colleague, a uh, collaborator of mine, Ido Drory, actually ran a series of experiments last year where he looked at the ability of some of these uh, large language models, such as, uh, you know, these uh, chat GPT-like systems to actually solve questions from exams, from MIT courses. Turns out, if you ask these systems to solve many of these questions from these exams, they can solve some, not very many of them. But if you go to them and you actually ask it to, instead of trying to solve the problem, to generate a program that solves the problem, well, all of a sudden, the system is able to leverage all of this knowledge that has been captured in all of these libraries. You know, the, model might not be so good at solving linear algebra problems, but guess what? There's a Python library for that. Turns out there's library, Python libraries for lots of things. You want to uh, control a robot? There's a Python library for that. You want to solve some differential equations? There's a Python library for that too. And so when AI systems are able to leverage all of these existing infrastructure, all of a sudden, they acquire this incredible power, but they can do even more. When they're able to leverage code as a representation for what they know, when they're able to write their own code, not only are they able to leverage all this knowledge that has been captured, they are able to produce knowledge of their own. And not only that, they're able to leverage this incredible investment in research and technology over decades on techniques to manipulate programs, to reason about them, to do analysis over them, to make predictions about how they're going to behave. To give you an example, uh, we ran a series of experiments uh, where we gave one of these systems a collection of tasks to solve, of various uh, levels of complexity. And so the system was asked to generate code in order to solve many of these tasks. Now, in the beginning, it was only able to generate code for a handful of them. But, and here's the crucial thing, by leveraging technologies from programming languages, it was able to then introspect on its own creations. It was able to analyze all of these pieces of code, identify common structures and common patterns, and encapsulate them into new libraries, new modules that then it could deploy to solve more problems. And by doing this repeatedly, the system was able to build on its own skills to improve its ability to solve problems by itself, right? So this ability to not just capture its knowledge as code, but then introspect on that knowledge, reorganize that knowledge, and redeploy it to new settings is a capability that is incredibly powerful. So, when we give our systems the ability to code, they acquire this, uh, this incredible power. Now, we're still a long way from having the kinds of AI systems that are really going to be trustworthy and dependable, that are actually going to be able to solve a lot of challenging problems for us. But this ability to write code is really going to be a crucial ingredient for that. Now, when we talk about systems like this writing code, there is a certain amount of anxiety. There is a certain amount of anxiety because this ability to write code has for a long time been a very valuable skill, one that uh, uh, has been very hard earned by many people. Uh, but one of the things to consider is that the essence of programming, this ability to describe very precisely what you want, this ability to take 
incredibly complex systems and to describe them in ways that are logical and well organized and in ways that actually allow you not just to deploy them but to reuse them and to adapt them to different uses, that need is not going to go away. And so as a final message, I'd like to say that on the one hand, if you are uh, you know, trying to deploy AI systems and are finding that the current technologies are not quite there for what you want to do, you really want to consider this neurosymbolic programming as a way to uh, get around some of these limitations. And at the same time, uh, if you are where I was 25 uh, years ago as uh, you know, a Mexican teenager in the middle of Texas, trying to uh, make, figure out how you're going to make your mark in the world, I would say that what worked for me still is going to work for you, not just despite these technological advances, but because of these technological advances, that this ability to write code really is a superpower and it's going to remain as valuable as it is today. Thank you.